Edit. Now it lets me share. Okay, so um, okay, are you guys seeing that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So um, okay, so I'm gonna do my ontological proof of moral realism. Um, and now you know I have to say some stuff about um, about reasons first, All right? So. You know, there's a type of reason known as a practical reason, and that's um, practical reason is a consideration that counts in favor of or against an action. Um, saying that you have reason to do something does not entail that you should do it, all things considered, right? It just means you have some reason to do it. That's compatible with having stronger reasons against it. This is just a terminological point. Okay. Also, um, you know, there's like, uh, there's sort of, Two kinds of reasons are two ways of talking about reasons, the first person and third person way of talking. So third person reasons are, well, okay, so there's an example where, let's say, um, you're thirsty and you want to take a drink and there's uh, a glass of something which you think is a glass of gin and you would like to drink it. And unbeknownst to you, it's actually filled with petrol. Okay, do you have a reason to drink it? Okay, and, you know, suppose that you like gin and, you know, it would be tasty. Okay. Uh, well, in in the third person sense, um, you have you have good reason not to drink it, and no no reason to drink it. In the first person sense, you have a reason to drink it. Okay, so first person reason is sort of a reason that's apparent from your own point of view. A third person reason is the reason that um, that you have sort of from the objective point of view, taking into account the actual facts of the situation. All right, so. Again, that's just uh, some terminology. So uh, you have a first person reason to drink it because you think that it's gin and it appears to be gin. And you have a third person reason to not drink it because it's not actually gin, it's actually petrol. Okay. Uh, now I have to explain what moral realism is. So I'm going to understand this in terms of moral reasons. So uh, moral realism holds that there are objective moral truths, but in particular, um, there are some objective moral reasons. And so these would be reasons that are non-selfish. I take it that a moral reason has to be a non-self-interested reason. Also categorical, meaning you have reason to do something whether you want to or not, and whether it helps to satisfy your desires or not. And also they should be observer independent, meaning that uh, when you have a moral reason to do something that doesn't depend upon the attitudes that observers would take towards your performing that action. Okay, so now this thesis is controversial, but it's not an absurd thesis. Many people hold this view, okay? So, you know, that stuff that I summarize, that's supposed to summarize what it means to have objective moral reasons, okay? So uh, there are many many smart people who believe moral realism, like, you know, there's a picture of Immanuel Kant here, like he would be a, an example of a moral realist. So I think it's fair to say that there's at least some reason to believe moral realism. And it doesn't have a probability of zero. You shouldn't assign probability zero to moral realism. Okay, and so like that's all that my argument is going to need. Okay, now here's a general principle about the way reasons work. Uh, it's something like, um, if there's a certain fact that would be a reason to perform a certain action, if you knew that fact, then th just having a chance that that thing is true gives you a reason to do that action, albeit a weaker reason, depending upon how big the probability is, all right? And uh, the reason that you have would be a first person reason, right? Um, because there might be no third person reason if the thing is not in fact true. But um, if from your point of view, there's a chance of the thing being true, then um, you have a reason to do the thing that would make sense to do if it was true. Okay. Um, all right, this is a little bit more precise statement of the principle. So suppose that A, the fact that P would be a reason to phi and B, the fact that not P wouldn't be a reason not to phi. And C, S has some reason to believe that P or P might be true. If all that obtains, then um, S thereby has a first person reason to phi. And I think I have some illustrations of this. So this works for all different kinds of reasons. So it even works for epistemic reasons. So suppose um, you have some reason to believe that John said that P. And you know, if John said that P, then that would be a reason to believe P. 
Okay, but you only but you don't know if John said that P. You just know that you have some reason to think he said that P. Then you also still have some reason to believe that P. Right? Makes sense. Okay, so like you know, evidence that evidence that there's evidence that P is evidence that P, roughly speaking. Okay, there's another illustration involving prudential reasons. So uh, there's a lottery ticket. The lottery ticket might be a winner. If it's a winner, then you should definitely buy it. So if you even have some reason to think that it's a winner, or if it even might be a winner, then you have some reason to buy it. Of course, the reason that you have to buy the ticket might be outweighed by the reason you have to not buy it, right? But the reason to buy the ticket is that it might be a winner. Uh, the reason to not buy it is, you know, it costs $3 or whatever, okay? And so that, you know, the second reason might outweigh the first, but it's still true that you have some reason to buy it. Okay. Uh, you know, just in virtue of there being a chance. Okay, uh, it also works for moral reasons. So um, if you knew that there was somebody in the woods, then you shouldn't fire your gun off in random directions in the woods. Okay, and so therefore, if there even might be someone in the woods, then you have a reason not to fire your gun off in random directions in the woods. Okay, so, and, you know, and how strong that reason is, again, depends upon what the probability is. So the more likely it is that there's somebody in the woods that you might hit, the stronger is the reason to not shoot the gun off. And, you know, if the lower the probability is, the weaker is the reason. Okay, and so this illustrates that this probabilistic reasons principle applies for all, for all different kinds of reasons, epistemic reasons, prudential reasons, moral reasons. If there are any other kinds of reasons, it applies to them as well. All right, sound good? Okay, um, this is a, another example involving moral reasons, but with moral uncertainty instead of factual uncertainty. So in the previous one, you were uncertain about a descriptive fact, like whether there's somebody in the woods. And here, let's say you're uncertain about a moral fact. So this is Lisa Simpson. Um, I guess she's eating some pork chops there or lamb chops there, and she's uh, wondering if it's wrong, wondering if it's wrong to eat the meat. Um, and suppose that she's uncertain about that. So it might be wrong to eat the meat. Well, then she has a reason not to eat it from the first person point of view, right? Uh, if, if there's even a chance that it's morally wrong to eat it, then she has a reason to avoid doing that. Okay. All right, now uh, I move on to a, another argument. This is an argument against torturing babies. This is not the argument for moral realism, to be clear. The argument for moral realism comes later on a later slide. This is a completely different argument. It's an argument against torturing babies, all right? So the first premise is the probabilistic reasons principle, right? That stuff about how if something might be true and if that thing were true, then you have a reason to do phi, then you have a reason to do phi, okay. And second premise, um, if baby torture were objectively wrong, then that would give you a reason to not torture babies. All right. And by the way, you know, torturing babies, just you can just have any example of anything that's wrong here, okay? Or anything that would seem to be wrong if moral realism is true. Okay. And even if baby torture wasn't objectively wrong, that still wouldn't be a reason to torture babies. And now there's some reason to think that baby torture is objectively wrong. So, you know, we don't know for so far, we don't know for sure if moral realism is true, but if it is, you know, baby torture is going to be one of the things that's objectively wrong, if anything is, because, you know, like basically everyone, everyone who believes in moral obligations agrees that this is one of them to not torture babies. Okay, so since it might be objectively wrong, we have a reason to avoid torturing babies. Okay, good. And now, so we established that there's a reason to not torture babies. Now we have to ask what kind of reason is this? And my claim is going to be it's an objective moral reason. Okay, so here's one argument for that conclusion. First, the premises of the, pre of the preceding argument are each true independent of your interests, your desires, and the attitudes of observers. Right, so like uh, the probabilistic reasons principle is not dependent on your interests, desires, or attitudes of observers. You could see that because um, it's it's a necessary truth. It appears to be a necessary truth. Uh, similarly, for the well, you know, looking looking at the other premises here, like looks like each of these things is true regardless of your interests, um, and regardless of your desires, and regardless of the attitudes of observers. All right, and. If P entails Q and P is true independent of X, then Q is true independent of X. 
And so therefore, the conclusion of the baby torture argument is true, independent of your interests, desires, and the attitudes of observers. Um, so you have a reason to avoid torturing babies that is independent of interest, desires, and observer attitudes. So it's an objective moral reason. Okay, here's a shorter argument for the same conclusion that it's an objective moral reason. The reason to avoid baby torture is that it might be objectively wrong. But that reason is obviously not an appeal to self-interest. It's not an appeal to your desires. And um, it's not an appeal to the attitudes of observers. So it's an objective moral reason. Okay, now I'm going to talk about objections that people might have. Um, so somebody might say, well, you know, like Humor said, it might be objectively wrong to torture babies, but it also might be objectively obligatory to torture them. So, you know, maybe we have an exactly counterbalancing reason. And then you might think if that's true, you know, maybe that just applies to all alleged moral reasons, that there's an, another equal and opposite reason counterbalancing it. Okay, but of course that's not true because... Um, you know, if there is a chance that torturing babies is obligatory, it's clearly a negligible chance. It's clearly much, much smaller than the probability that we're obligated to not do it, right? And so overall, we have net reason to avoid doing it. Um, and, you know, and like, why do I say that? Because basically everyone who believes in morality agrees that, you know, torturing babies would be one of the things that was wrong. Okay. Uh, another another possible objection, you know, humor's argument depends on trusting our ethical intuitions. Like, you know, I'm just relying on the intuition that you shouldn't torture babies. Okay, but I note that, you know, we only have to assume, we don't have to assume that ethical intuition is reliable. We only have to assume that it might be reliable. Right, and that's enough for there to be some reason to think that torturing babies is wrong, and that's enough for us to get some moral reason to avoid it. Right, um, and you know, even among the people who think that ethical intuition is not in fact reliable, they wouldn't say that it's impossible that it's reliable. So um, it's pretty much universally agreed that it might be reliable. Okay, uh, another thing you might think, maybe the probabilistic reasons principle is non-objective. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it's non-objective, you know, maybe it depends upon the attitudes of observers because um, it talks about reasons, it, it, the consequent of it says you have a reason to do phi. Uh, and maybe like all claims about reasons depend on observers' attitudes or something. All right, so in response, I know, well, the probabilistic reasons principle, it works for all kinds of reasons, not just moral reasons. So even if you're like a subjectivist or something about morality, um, you're probably not a subjectivist about all reasons. So the probabilistic reasons principle is just true about reasons in general. Um, and, you know, non-moral reasons don't depend on attitudes of observers. So the probabilistic reasons principle should be true independent of attitudes of observers. It appears to be a necessary truth about the nature of reasons. Um, I note also that the probabilistic reasons principle is a conditional. So it contains in the consequent, it says something about reasons for action, but it doesn't assert that there are any reasons for action. So even if you if you're a subjectivist about reasons, even if you think there aren't really any reasons for anything, that shouldn't prevent you from accepting the the conditional, right? That you know, if there was something that would be a reason, if you knew it, then if there was a chance that it's true, then that then that gives you a reason for action. You know, you shouldn't um, shouldn't reject that, even if you're skeptical about the antecedent. Okay, another objection. Um, maybe the probabilistic reasons principle fails to apply in cases where um, you have theoretical uncertainty about reasons. Right. In other words, like there could be different philosophical theories about the nature of reasons, and maybe the principle doesn't apply in that case. Um, and why would somebody think that? Um, and so one thought is... Um, facts about rationality don't provide reasons for action. So some people think this. Um, facts about what it is rational to do just report on what reasons for action you have. They don't themselves constitute reasons for action. So like if you find out that it's rational to do A on this view that some people hold, that isn't a reason to do A. The fact that it's rational to do A is just the fact that there's some other thing that is a reason to do A, right? But the existence of a thing that's a reason to do A isn't another reason to do A. Okay. Um, 
All right. And uh, OK, and you might think if rationality fact, facts don't provide reasons, then the probabilistic reasons principle doesn't apply to cases of theoretical uncertainty about reasons. Um, and so, OK, so this would be this would be the objector's claim. So the probabilistic reasons principle doesn't apply in cases of theoretical uncertainty about reasons. Um, all right. So the thought is like, you know, like imagine that, well, there's a theory which implies so we have a disagreement about whether X is a reason to do A. And there's a theory that says X is a reason to do A. And then there's another theory that other philosophers hold that says X isn't a reason to do A. Suppose both of those theories might be true. You might want to say just the fact that both of them might be true doesn't mean that X is a reason to do A. Or it doesn't mean that you have a reason to do A. Because whichever theory is false, so, you know, like um, the theory that's correct by definition, that's the theory that gives the account of what we really have a reason to do. And the theory that is in fact wrong, even though it might be, even though we don't know that it's wrong, you shouldn't get reasons uh, for action from the theory, from the incorrect theory of act, of reasons. Right, that was sort of the thought there. Okay. And so my response to this is no, facts about rationality do provide reasons for action. Um, oh, okay. This was explaining why you would think these things. All right, but I'm going to skip over that. All right, so anyway, my response is facts about rationality do provide reasons for action. So that is, if you if you learn that it would be rational to do A, that is a reason to do A. All right, so you know, my example is, uh, you know, God shows you this red button and says, hey, uh, you can push this button if you want. And God tells you, if you push this button, it will be in your interest. I promise you that it will be in your interest to press it, but I'm not going to tell you how or why. Um, okay, so... Question, is it prudent to push the button? All right, and uh, you're supposed to have the intuition that obviously it is prudent to push the button. But what could be your reason for, for pressing it? The reason for pressing it could only be the general fact that it's in your interest, right? So you don't know how it's going to benefit you. So whatever benefit you're going to get, that couldn't be the reason for pushing it. The reason has to be the general fact that you have prudential reason to do it. So facts about what reasons you have overall have to themselves constitute reasons for action. Uh, another example is, okay, God gives you a blue button and he says, hey, I promise you that, you know, you have the most third person reason to push this button, but I'm not going to tell you what the reasons are. You know, something will happen that you have reason to bring about, but I'm not going to tell you what. Okay. And now is it rational to push the button? And then it looks like, again, yes, it is. Okay. So um, facts, you know, Facts about what is rational or what you have reason to do do themselves constitute reasons for action. Okay. Um, all right, I think I'm going to skip over this. I think I'm going to not do everything. Okay, so anyway, my concluding thoughts are uh, moral realism is true and the human theory of reasons is false. The human theory of reason says um, you only get reasons for action from desires. You have a reason to do something only if there's some goal that you want and you believe that the action will lead to that goal. Uh, and this argument shows that that's not true because you could have a reason for doing something just because um, you could have an intellectual reason for doing something just because you believe that it might be objectively required independent of your desires. And so you know, the mere possibility of that is enough to show that um, it's not only desires that can provide reasons for action. Okay. Um, that's all. Um, I, I think we have time for questions and answers. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I do have some questions and it'll move on to the part where others can ask questions as well. So uh, in your paper, I do believe there's a part in it where you defend the fourth premise of the argument against uh, torturing babies, not the argument for more realism. And that was premise four, that we have some reason to think uh, more realism is true. And the argument I believe you gave was uh, that Wait, that plenty of sorry, intellectual... Some reason to th sorry, I think the premise is there's some reason to think that baby torture is objectively wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, that is it. Yeah. Yep. That, uh, the reason for that is that there's plenty of philosophers out there, plenty of intelligent philosophers out there who believe in more realism. Is that correct? Was that your argument? Yeah, well, that's a reason, yeah. And okay. you know, plus, like, you know, I've written this great book and, you know, people should read it. And, 
I have it. Uh, I have it with me. Yeah. yeah. It's really good. <laughs> And you know, and it's not a dumb book, <laughs> and it defends more. No, so there's some reason to think that moral realism might be true. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, you wouldn't say this is like an. It, would you say this is a supplementary argument for moral realism, or this is like a standalone argument you could use? Oh, just the the appeal to the opinions of philosophers. Yeah. 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 So, um, well, that is a reason to believe moral realism. It's not that strong because the consensus isn't that strong. Um, moral realism is the majority view. So there's a survey of philosophers' opinions, the Phil Papers survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look up online. It. So moral mm -hmm. realism, it's the plurality view. I don't remember what the percentages are. Um, so it's probably correct from that. However, philosophers have been wrong so much that this is not a really very strong argument by itself. Gotcha. I think it's very easy accessible, but so is ethical intuitionism, the book. And I really, really enjoyed that one, that book. Uh, that was just curious about that point, because it seemed that premise four is, I think, tr like that premise four is true. Uh, I was just wondering, like, OK, like, what if there's no humans around, right? Like, full, then would that mean that that argument would fall apart? Because I think most moral, moral realists would say that objective moral reasons exist independent of any humans existing. And it's simply this argument relies on, on the existence of people being around. I hope it makes, okay. it makes sense there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. So, I mean, you might think, well, if there were no babies, then baby torture would be impossible. So, <laughs> so would it then be false that baby torture is wrong? <laughs> and then, and then I want to say, no, it would still be that it's, it would still be wrong. It just would die in the intended sense, right? Because the intended sense is if you get a chance to torture a baby, you shouldn't do it. So that would still be true. And if there were no babies to be tortured, all right? And then you might think, oh, but what if there were no agents either? All right. And then, and you know, it's the same thing, right? Like, so the fact that it's wrong to murder doesn't imply the existence of any people. It just means like, if there was an agent who had a chance to murder, then they shouldn't do it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That doesn't make sense. Do you think that this is more related to your book, the, the book you just presented, Ethical Intuitionism? Ethical is intu intuitionism, is it, it's compatible with naturalism and theism, correct? Yeah, that seems right. Okay. Okay. Um, but it's not compatible with divine command theory, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's my understanding. Yeah, I mean, in the book, I say that the divine command theory is actually a form of subjectivism. Divine command mm -hmm. theorists don't like that. They don't want to be called subjectivists. But uh, the reason is, so, you know, subjectivism is a view that moral truths depend on the attitudes of observers. And the divine command theory just posits uh, one particularly interesting observer, but he's still an observer, <laughs> where our moral mm -hmm. obligations depend on that observer's attitudes, right, namely God. You know, so there's only one of him, so it's not going to vary from one person. You know, like your obligations won't vary from one person to another or one culture to another, uh, which is good. But it's still subjective because it still depends on that observer, observer's attitudes. Gotcha, gotcha. And is ethical intuitionism compatible with robust realism? Um, robust realism about ethics? About ethics, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, oh, wait, sorry. Define robust there. Robust. So the way I've seen it being used is that there exists, I mean, it's kind of general, right? Like there exists moral facts about the world that are independent of, of, uh, of observers of like what you just mentioned earlier. Right. Um, that's the way I've seen it be defined. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, ethical intuitionism entails moral realism. It's just a form of moral realism. So mm -hmm. it's moral realism plus an account of um, how we know about the moral truths. There are objective moral truths, and how do we know about them? Partly on the basis of a thing called ethical intuition. Um, mm. Now, I was thinking that the robust might mean something like there's a small number of people who think that moral properties have causal powers, and that's like, and so that makes it more robust. And I, I don't think that. Um, I'm not sure if they have causal powers, but if they do, they don't affect anything other than our minds, right? But I'm not even sure that they can affect our minds, you know, causally. 
question gotcha, about gotcha. I have a question about in, uh, intuition. Now, what, what, where do we get intuitions through perception? Oh, um, yeah. Well, I guess I should say what an intuition is. So, um, an intuition is an initial intellectual appearance. Okay, right. So, initial meaning it's not dependent upon um, going through an argument or making an inference from other propositions. And intellectual meaning it results from thinking about the thing intellectually as opposed to using the five senses or memory or um, whatever. Yeah, that's empirical faculties. Uh, and an appearance is um, a state of something seeming to you to be the case. Okay, so when you have an ethical intuition, there's some moral proposition that seems to you to be correct as a result of just thinking about it directly and as opposed to observation or going through a process of reasoning. So could you have an intuition without perception? Um, I don't, well, I don't see why not. I mean, you know, using the senses, you know, having, having, having that sensory input. Yeah. Well, um, your intuitions in general don't depend upon observation or sense perception. Okay. Uh, right. So it's, it's supposed to be intellectual reflection. Okay. And now, you know, you might, you might dispute this. So, um, uh, but, you know, okay. So ethical intuitions are just intuitions about ethics. They're intuitions about lots of other things, like the shortest path between any two points must be a straight line. Okay. That's just an intuition. All right, and you might think, oh, but that depends upon observation because you have to like see objects in space in order to form the concepts or whatever. Okay, but my claim is it doesn't depend on observation in the relevant way. It doesn't depend epistemologically on observation. Okay, because um, none of your none of your perceptual observations have to actually be true. Yeah. So, right, so like. If everything that you've ever seen with the senses has been a hallucination, you still know that the shortest path between two points is a straight line. Okay, so this would fall in with the, uh, I'm, I'm reading uh, Donald Hoffman, if you haven't heard of him. Um, but basically, he's basically making that claim that, uh, uh, that uh, everything is a, a form of a hallucination. So this would still entail that you still have those intuitive, uh, ethical reasoning still is occurring at that point. Yeah, yeah. So... Okay. Okay. Yeah. So like, yeah, even if um, I'm a brain in a vat and everything I've seen <laughs> with my eyes and so on has been hallucinatory, okay. um, you know, I still know that it's wrong to torture babies. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if any babies exist, but I know that yeah. if they do, you shouldn't torture them. <laughs> Thank you. Gotcha. Gotcha. So since I brought it up, actually, how could you, how do you define ethical intuitionism? I think you defined it in your book, but I can't quite remember how how you defined it how would you define it uh so i mean it's it's the view that um there are objective ethical truths and we know about them on the basis of ethical intuition basically yeah okay. so there's, yeah there's okay. an ontological part and a epistemological part gotcha gotcha oh well, do you yeah i get i guess i should say another thing is uh intuitionists generally say that the um moral properties are irreducible mm -hmm. So you can't explain what goodness is without using other evaluative terms. You can't explain it purely using descriptive language. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Do you present the syllogism from the paper we just talked about, the, the ontological proof paper in ethical intuitionism, or is this like a completely new argument that you present? Yeah, it was, it was not in that book because I hadn't thought of it yet. And so mm. it's in a later paper, yeah. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Or do you think, I mean, I think you already answered this, but you think that that book is stronger than the argument made in that paper? Oh, um, I don't know. Because I, I mean, I think the ontological proof by uh, moral realism is a proof. Okay. <laughs> However, I don't know mm -hmm. that it's the most persuasive. Like, it might be a stronger argument, but less persuasive because most people when they hear a proof of a controversial philosophical thesis like they immediately resist it so <laughs> and and they think that they're being tricked and when you read ethical intuitionism you won't feel like you're being tricked so it might be more persuasive right oh yeah because yeah. like, like the arguments are sort of more intuitive <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. it's more intuitive that that's how you might know Gotcha. Did you write this paper and the book with the intention of reaching a like 
layman, like of reaching a general audience? Because they're both really accessible. Yes, sort of. Well, I mean, I never wanted my work to be only read by a handful of um, specialists, right? Because then I feel like I'm wasting my time, right? So, I mean, I wanted it to be read by a lot of people, but, um, but you know, I am aware that there's a limited audience for these kinds of things. So I would describe it as being mm -hmm. for um, not necessarily professional philosophers, but people who are, you know, have intellectual interests, right? It's, it's a book for intellectuals. You know, let's, let's be serious about that. But you don't have to be a philosopher and have read a bunch of philosophy stuff specifically. Gotcha. I see. And I, and I, and I do agree. I do like that this book is really accessible because I was surprised. I thought it was sold by a, uh, a public or popular publisher, but I guess not. It was, but it's, no. I've really enjoyed no. it so far. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Uh, it was, it's published by Paul Gray of Macmillan, which is the academic branch of Macmillan, which is why it's expensive. And a bunch of my books are, you know, overly expensive because they're from academic presses and academic presses always price the books pretty high. Yeah, that is fair. I got yours from the library admittedly, but I protected it very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So your book on ethical intuitionism, you do have a section where you address objections. One of them being, um, let's see. Well, let me start here. Which section or which more real to, uh, relativism. How do you respond to that in the book? Because I haven't actually gotten that far. I just in the part over ethical intuitionism. Yeah. So yeah. So the relativists think that moral truths can vary from one person to another, or from one society to another. And I guess the more popular version has been the societal version that there are different moral truths in different cultures. Right. And how could this be true? Well, I guess um, I guess the way that it could be true is if for a thing to be morally wrong just is for it to be disapproved of by some person or group, right? So like maybe wrong just means disapproved by society. In that case, what actions are wrong varies from one society to another. So it's, quote, relative, relative to our culture. Okay, and what's wrong with that? Uh, well, you know, um, perhaps you've seen the the... Um, popular movie Schindler's List. Okay, so this is a this is a movie about Oscar Schindler, who was it was a I think German businessman during World War II, and it's a it was about how he saved a bunch of Jews from going to the concentration camps by employing them in his factories, and he had to convince the Nazis to let him keep these Jews in his factories instead of going to the concentration camps, right? And he was pretending um, to the Nazis he was pretending that he was doing it for the money. That he just wanted cheap labor. In fact, he was losing tons of money, right? And you know, wound up going bankrupt. Okay. Uh, so, but you know, he saved like hundreds or thousands of lives or something. I think maybe around a thousand or something like that. Okay. So now, um, true or false? Oscar Schindler was the villain of that movie. Uh, uh, false. <laughs> I see what you're doing. He was uh, not. Uh -huh. He was not the villain of the movie. However, what he was doing was disapproved by his society. Right? So, mm. right, he was in a society in which the conventions that were accepted at the time were that you have to send Jews to concentration camps. Uh, okay, so uh, and you know examples like that, right? If you lived in the American South um, before the Civil War, you know, and you helped slaves by society, but it wasn't wrong, it was right. <laughs> so that shows that to be wrong isn't just to be disapproved by society, okay. And then, you know, there's just like a similar argument for any other subjectivist theory. So if somebody mm -hmm. says, well, no, uh, I, I don't think it's dependent on the culture, it's just dependent on the individual. So where something to be wrong is just for it to be disapproved by me, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> then, you know, mm -hmm. well, just imagine a hypothetical situation in which you had horrible attitudes, like, um, you wanted to torture babies. I said, true or false? In that scenario, it would be morally right to torture babies. False, right? It would not be mm -hmm. right. Okay. So anyway, like you know, there's there's multiple arguments, but that's sort of like the I don't know the biggest, most obvious problem with relativism. Gotcha, gotcha. You address other schools of thought or other forms of relativism that are more specific. I'm pretty sure. 
that that is one big one but um let's talk about divine command theory is it your response to that essentially the same yeah well um yeah there's a couple of things yeah so you could imagine god ordering us to do something horrible then you could have the intuition well may, maybe some people would not agree but <laughs> you know you can you could have the intuition that you shouldn't do that thing in that situation. Uh, some religious people would say, no, you got to do it. Right. So like, mm -hmm. um, you know, when God ordered Abraham to um, sacrifice his son, Isaac, and then you know, Abraham, it's like, he goes, the, gets the knife and he starts taking his son up to the top of the mountain. He's ready to murder him because a voice told him to do that. <laughs> and, um, and then at the end, God says, okay, you don't have to do it. I was just kidding. And then, <laughs> the Bible that's supposed to be really good, but I don't think that's really good. <laughs> like what, you know, what if your dad told you that that happened? <laughs> if your dad said, Hey, you know, son, like the other day, God told me to murder you. And I got my knife, you know, when you were in bed and I was just about to stab you, but then God told me it was okay. I didn't have to do it. And then, then your dad goes, you see how great I am. You see what a great person I am. <laughs> I bet you would not think that. <laughs> Anyway, one of the other things that people say about divine command theory, you know, if you don't agree with me about that part, and like the popular classic objection is, well, you know, are actions wrong because God told us not to do them? Or did God tell us not to do them because they were wrong? Mm -hmm. so, like, yeah. yeah, so God, so it's, it's, it's said that God gave us a commandment not to murder. Why did he do that? Why did he tell us not to murder? A plausible answer is he told us not to murder because it's wrong to murder. Right? But then that means that it can't be that it's wrong only because God told us. It had to it had to have been wrong already for some other reason. Right. Now, you know, suppose you say no, it wasn't already wrong. Well then what possible man. And it would have would have to be that he couldn't have any moral reasons. Like if all if all of morality comes from God, then God couldn't have had any moral reasons behind why he gives his commandments. So, and that means everything God does is arbitrary. Or that all of his commandments are completely arbitrary. There's no reason for giving them. Right. But then it's like it's hard to see why somebody giving completely arbitrary commands would generate an obligation to do those things. Mm. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh Let's see other schools of thought out there. Um, what are do you deal with some less, some more uh, obscure theories of of ethics in your book, or just some more popular yeah. ones? Yeah, there's um, so there's there are five theories of meta ethics, right? So um, you know, there's two forms of realism and three forms of anti realism. So you know, realism is just the view that there are objective moral truths. Okay, so one form of realism is intuitionism. The other form is naturalism, which claims that moral truths are reducible to descriptive truths. So you could explain what goodness is using purely descriptive language. Now, most people find that highly counterintuitive. So um, I would not normally spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, only philosophers think that that might be the case, okay. Um, and then, okay, the three forms of anti-realism. So anti-realism holds that there aren't any objective moral truths. So that means that either moral statements are always false, or um, they're neither true nor false, or maybe they're sometimes true, but their truth depends upon the attitudes of observers, right? And those are the only possibilities. If there aren't, if none of those is the case, there have to be objective moral truths, right? So mm -hmm. you know, put it this way, like, um, okay, if if the moral statements are either true or false, they're not always false, then they got to be sometimes true. And if they're, if the truth or falsity doesn't depend on attitudes of observers, that means it's objective. So there have to be objective moral truths. Okay. So, so that's why there's only three forms of anti-realism. Right. And so we talked about the subjectivity, subjectivity slash relativism version. We didn't talk about the other two, right? The, the idea that they're neither true nor false um, sometimes referred to as non-cognitivism or expressivism, right? Um, in the, the people who say this, the reason they're saying that is um, they think moral statements don't really assert anything, 
Like when you say murder is wrong, you're not really making a claim about anything. You're not saying that something has a property. What you're doing is something more like you're expressing your negative attitudes about murder. And so that's neither true nor false. It's like when you say, ouch, you know, that's neither true nor false. Or <laughs> you say, you know, boo on murder. Okay, that's neither true nor false. That's just expression of emotion. Okay. And the last theory is nihilism, which is the view that, um, okay, so there are these moral statements. They're either true or false. Um, and actually, they are asserting that things have objective moral properties, but nothing has objective moral properties, so they're always false, right? So, okay, so according to the nihilist, nothing is either right or wrong, and nothing is either good or bad. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. It, it, nihilism is not a... It's not, it's a pretty obscure position in philosophy, right? Um, uh, mean unpopular? I don't yeah. know. I mean, um, so there's no consensus. And I think that moral realism is the most popular view. Mm -hmm. Most of the realists, well, well, it is the most popular view according to the Phil Paper survey. Yes. Um, and now, you know, which form of realism is more popular? I'm not sure. Uh, so I don't think there are a lot of nihilists, but um, it's not like unheard of. It's it's really not surprising to run into somebody who's a nihilist. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot more popular than like external world skepticism. Oh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> oh, you know, like the people who think that we don't know anything about the, the physical world, right? Like there's very few of those people. And there's significantly more people who think that like there's no moral truths. This guy, but, Donald... Donald, no, no, sorry. Donald Hoffman, I would say, would fit under that camp. Yeah, an external world skeptic? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. All right. Uh, no, you're, no worries. All right, so one last question I wanted to ask before I can let the others ask questions. Um, what got you into philosophy? Um, I mean, I guess that I took a philosophy class in college, and, uh, and it was awesome. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and it was the most it was the most interesting class that I had, you know, either before or since, other than other philosophy classes. So um, and you know, and then you know, I thought, um, you know, okay, so I wanted to take more philosophy classes, but also then I had to think, well, but could I actually do that as a career? And um, but you know, there were a lot of different things that I could do. Um, you know, like I was good at a lot of different things. But I thought that, well, I should use my abilities to do the thing that's most important. And so I tried to think about what's the thing that's most important that I, I would be good at. And then I decided that it was philosophy because um, the questions that philosophers address are sort of the broadest questions. And they they influence how you think about everything else. And so it's most important to get those things right. And so I should spend my time trying to get philosophical questions right. That's more important than getting any other kind of question right. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for the second time for, for the Southwestern College Philosophy Club. It's been an honor. And hopefully we can have you a third time. Um, yeah, you're welcome. I think we can end the recorded part here. Hannah, can you end the recording?